So, there it goes. Okay. So, first things first, let's uh, go ahead and silence our phones, please. Let's put it on vibrate. Por favor. This, this afternoon, or this evening, I wanted to start off with a, a, a small, quick story. And uh, I, I figured it was worth telling. I won't, I won't take up too much time because I know they're going to say and stuff like that. So when I was coming, during my struggles and coming to the Lord and stuff like that, I was sitting at a church one day and I was like, ah, oh. it's like, Father, I don't, I don't know what you want me to do. I'm, I'm, I'm lost. I'm, I'm really not learning anything here. It's like, I don't know what, what you have for me, what you have, what you want me to do or anything like that. I was just sitting in the chair by myself in, in the back and I think the, the worship was on and stuff like that. I just had my head down and my, you know, my hands in my face and just rubbing and stuff like that. I'm like, Father, I don't know what you want me to do. Father, you know, show me something. You know, I'm not asking for a sign or nothing like that, like that, but just, you know, whatever it is, you know, just, I know it's going to be you, Father. Show me that you, that I'm worth saving. Because I'm so lost. And while I was saying saying that and talking to him, I put this on my grandfather. I was sitting down on a chair and something or someone touched touched the back of my head, like in a fatherly way. And was just holding it like this. And it was so warm. And when I turned around and looked back, there was nobody in there. So and it was crazy. And then after that, it was just, you know, all about God. And I said, all right. Okay, so you proved to me. But I know we're not looking for signs. You're not supposed to look for signs. But for me that day, God showed me something. He touched me. You know, not everybody agrees with, well, you know, I'm too busy. I'm do this. I'm do that. And we don't have time for church on Sundays or Saturdays or anything like that. But you, but you got Time to go to the bar. You got time to throw parties. You got time to do this and do that and be with the people who are worldly. Why don't you make time for God? And with that being said, you know, a lot of them say, ah, we don't need it. You know, we'll be okay. You know, and with that, if God says it, then we believe it, right? Amen. Hebrews 10 and 23 to 25. It says, let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering. For he who is promised is faithful. And let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day drawing near. With that being said, there's over 20 Bible verses, and I'm not going to get into it because we'll be here forever. Shows that we are together and to love one another and bring, you know, encourage to, to be in God's word more, to do godly things, get away from the world. You know, being in the world, you ain't going nowhere. But with that being said, I'm not going to hold you up. You know, I just want to share that quick story and, and, and that um, verse and stuff like that. But if y'all want to stand with me, let's open up a prayer so we can get our worship on. Father, we give you thanks for this evening, Father. Let your word be nourished into our minds and our hearts and our ears. We know what you say is the truth. And what you do for us is unimaginable for us. Because we can't fathom the love that you have for all your children. We give you thanks for tonight. We give you thanks for all those who are here with us. And those who are watching, they may watch later in the future. May you bless them. Take care of them, Father. And if they come to you, Father, I ask that you heal their illness, Father. But more so, may you open their eyes and their heart to the things of Jesus. Leave, let them leave the world, worldly things behind. 
I only need you, Father, in my life. You are the light in all of our lives. And we all know, Father, for where two or three are gathered in my name, there I am among them. Matthew 18, 20. We give you thanks for all that you do and continue to do in our lives, Father. We love you dearly with all our hearts. Keep us safe. As we finish off this week, Father, till Sunday, where we can gather amongst our brothers and sisters in Christ and praise you and honor you and worship you, Father. We love you for all the things you continue to do in our lives, Father. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.
Turn to your neighbor and tell them God is good all the time. And all the time, God is so good. Ooh, you can take your seats, praise God. Man, thank you, Jesus. Well, welcome, everyone. How's everybody doing? Yes? Yeah. Good to see all the different faces and the familiar faces and everybody else who's here. We don't really have any announcements this evening because we're going to be here for a little bit. I mean, I'm trying to get through this word to get us to chapter five of Ephesians, because when we get to chapter six of Ephesians, the armor of God, probably be there for half a year. No, I'm kidding. Go be there for a while. It's going to be good when we get there. I'm anxious and eager to skip chapter five. Just go to six. But we'll, 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 we'll be patient. We'll be patient. We'll be patient. So Kalmari, Kalmari, calm down. So what we'll do, we will release the little children in right now. Let's go ahead and release them uh, since we don't have no other announcements to make. We'll release them. They can go around through the back, through the side over there and uh, uh, to prevent from tripping, flipping, falling, and then bawling. <laughs> Ooh, boy. Hmm, hmm, hmm. It's them little Vasquez boys, man. Man. Got them? All right. Praise God. So... We are still in this series that we're in. We do have, let's give the Lord a round of applause. We've got a new laptop, amen. Remember, remember the other laptop, that ghost laptop, where I'm talking about something and it does what it wants to do. I'm like, come on, bro, stop. And I got to keep coming back and keep coming back. So we got a different laptop, amen. And uh, I, hope that, I hope it continues to work well. We'll find out. We'll find out. If not, we'll be donating it to somebody. Just, just take it. Take it. Or we'll go to old school where I'll, I'll write on a little whiteboard, you know what I mean? And then erase it. I don't have carpal tunnel no more. I've been healed. Amen. Let's do, let's do this tonight. Let's try to finish this portion of Ephesians 4. This is our last part of a divine transformation. And it's going to be a, a, a long final Bible study tonight. Okay. Are y'all okay with that? I mean, y'all didn't drive all the way over here just to leave in 30 minutes, right? Okay, all right. Because I know when you go home, you're going to go and put your little onesie on, get your little ice cream and sit in bed and watch a movie for two hours. You know what I mean? So enjoy this tonight. Get it in you tonight. And do not forget it because there are a lot of questions that are going to be answered in the study tonight. Okay? So a divine transformation, part five. Let's see what we can do with this. In Ephesians chapter four, verse 17 through 24, let's look at this. In Ephesians chapter 4. Did it do it? Oh, have mercy. Mm. I don't know if it's the phone that does it. something. Man, something's going on here. We're going to have to really answer and solve this problem because, ooh, it's the Android phones. Ephesians 4, beginning in verse 17. Once again, let's try to get through this. Verse 17. So this I say and affirm together with the Lord that you walk no longer just as the Gentiles also walk in the futility of their mind. Notice that he's commanding us to do something. Okay. He's saying, uh, I, he says, I say this and affirm together with the Lord that you walk no longer just as the Gentiles walk. I need you to understand this once and for all. Don't ever forget this again because you'll come across people who make comments about you working for your salvation or you working to earn your salvation or you having to do something within your own strength. And I need you to see is that everything that God commands 
We can do nothing without the help of the Holy Spirit in us. So even though he tells us you must do this, he's not saying you must do this on your own accord. He's saying you must do this and you better be blessed and happy and, and grateful that you got the Holy Ghost to help you do it. You know what I mean? Because some people will say, well, the Bible says that, it, you know, you better examine yourself and be aware and be sure because lest you fall short. OK, yes, it says that. But it says that to those of us who have the Holy Spirit, because sometimes we could get lazy as Christians and not let the Holy Spirit lead and guide us. You know what I mean? The Holy Spirit is against being gluttons, but we still eat like we're crazy. Don't you know what I'm talking about? That's a sin, too. You know what I mean? And then the Holy Spirit, you know, he does not like when people procrastinate. And, you know, that's a sin to procrastinate too long and put things off over and over. That God's a God of order, you know. So what's the difference, right? And it's not that you're not saved and not, don't have the Holy Ghost. It's just that you're not giving yourself over to him in that area. You're letting your mind control that part. You're like, mm -mm, Jesus, I'm going to procrastinate. Don't tell me to organize this. I ain't organizing nothing yet. You know what I mean? Don't look at each other, husbands and wives. Don't do that. Everybody's like, see me, huh? What did I tell you? No. Verse 18. Being darkened in their understanding, excluded from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them, because of the hardness of their heart. And they, having become callous, have given themselves over to sensuality for the practice of every kind of impurity with greediness. Notice that it says, for the practice of. Born again Christians, we're not perfect. And we will sin, but we don't sin willfully or in a manner where we're practicing sin. You got it? It just happens upon us because we're two different people now. We're a new creature in Christ. You know, we're Second Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17, that if we are in Christ, we are new creatures. But even though we're new creatures, the difference between us and people who aren't new creatures is that we feel the conviction when we do fall short. The person who's not the new creature could care less when they fall short, you know? That's the difference. You catch yourself, and you might have gone off on your husband or gone off on your kids or your wife or had a thought about your boss who made you work that extra shift or do something, but then the Lord tells you, hey, I know you don't want to work that shift, and, and you know that maybe he was wrong, but what did I tell you? Be kind and, and be grateful that you even got a job. Remember, it was him who gave you that position. Remember that? And so the Lord starts rewinding you, you know, that's the difference. That's why we're a new creation. We're not just a new creation because the Bible has a title. You're a new creation because you operate different. The person who doesn't have the Holy Ghost, man, the boss puts, I ain't, man, he better find somebody else. I ain't sure. You know what I'm talking about? That's not a new creation. That's still the same old person, you know. And here in verse 19, it says, and they, having become callous, have given themselves over to sensuality for the practice of every kind of impurity with greediness. But you did not learn Christ in this way. If indeed you have heard him and have been taught in him, just as truth is in Jesus, that in reference to your former manner of life, you lay aside the old self, which is being corrupted in accordance with the lust of deceit. How do you lay aside the old self? By learning what the new self is supposed to do. You see, the Holy Spirit will lead and guide you, but he can only lead and guide you based on what you know, because what you don't know will prevent the Holy Spirit from being able to lead and guide you. If you don't know that the Lord desires for you to be kind even to those who are your enemies, if you haven't learned that yet, when an enemy of yours is around you, you'll still be an enemy to them. You won't be kind and gentle and loving to them, yet being cautious. You know what I mean? If you never read that, then you won't know how to respond. But this is the way it works. And don't forget this either. When you become a new creation, the Holy Ghost is inside of you. What you learn in God's word, the Holy Spirit, at the moment when you need to live out, practice that obedience to God, he'll remind you what you learned. You got it? And he'll put it before you. I'm, I'm putting it before you. You decide. You're going to do this? Well, you ain't going to do this because if you don't do it, you're going to feel yicky, you know, icky and ugly in a little bit and the conviction is going to come on. But I'm reminding you the word that you learned this past week, pastor was teaching, to love even your enemies. And right there, boom, the conviction comes because you're a new creation in Christ. Boom, you respond to the word. You got it? The other people who aren't born again, they don't even have that. They just have, I'm going to do me, dog. You better watch out. You know what I mean? They don't have that. That's what makes us new creations in Christ. 
We're always going to stumble. We're always going to be growing in the Lord. And the more we're growing, the more we're going to fall. Because we're falling forward. You know what I mean? We're learning in the Lord. But a true believer who's filled with the Holy Spirit doesn't practice sinning. You don't practice sinning. I don't, I don't, you know, desire to hurry up and finish the service tonight so I can go home and practice sinning. You know what I mean? That's not the way I think anymore. Matter of fact, if I even was to consider sinning immediately because I'm a new creation, the Holy Ghost will tell me, really? Are you serious? And the conviction comes. I'm like, no, that was a dumb thought. Forgive me. You know what I mean? So y'all understand that you're not perfect, right? I'm glad. I'm glad you understand that you're not perfect because I'm not either. All right. The difference is, let's just say it again, this is like our motto. We need to put this, when we finally get our own place, we need to have it big words, a banner, you know. We're not what? And what do we always say about sin, right? Say that again. We're not sinless, but here we have learned to sin what? Less. That's going to be our banner. We're not sinless, but here we've learned to sin less. How? Because the word that we learn is what follows us and corrects us all the time. That's why when you learn God's word, you don't need no one, your wife in your ear. But what I tell, you know Jesus don't like that. Why, why do you got to tell him? Why do you got to tell him? Because he hasn't learned that yet. But if he learned it and he was filled with the spirit, you wouldn't have to tell him. Immediately when he was going to do that, the Holy Spirit would tell him, really, bro? Really? And you'd be like, no, not really. <laughs> right? You hear what I'm saying? And for those that you always got to keep correcting on that, it's because they haven't learned that yet. So you should sit down with them in the word and get in the word with them. You know what I mean? Man, come on, man. Stop holding me up. Let's go to the next verse. Verse 23. That in reference to your former manner of life, you lay aside the old self, which is being corrupted in accordance with the lust of deceit. And that you be renewed in the spirit of your mind. There it is. Where does the newness begin first? The first step to being made brand new is that God gives you a brand new heart. And when he gives you a brand new heart, it needs to be filled. Filled with what? Not the corruption in the old ways you used to learn from your uncle and your aunt and my, my cousins and my brothers who taught me how to stick the finger and say bad words. It's a new heart. I need to fill the new heart with the word of God. And so my new heart gets filled and what's happening? My old mind that had old habits begins to be renewed based on the new heart being filled with the new word of God on how to live new. You got that? Now my mind is being renewed. You got that? It's being renewed. It says, and you, that you be renewed in the spirit of your mind. Why? Because You've been given a new heart where the Holy Spirit's at. And you, you got a new spirit, a born again spirit. That's why your flesh wants to sin. We'll see that in a little bit. But your spirit doesn't want to. And your spirit, your new creation, your new self is. There's really no one you should be hating. If there's anyone you should hate. And, and even then God says to pray for them. That's people who are evil. And even then he tells us to pray for like Hitler and Mussolini and for Putin, you know. And for Biden, you know, pray for we even pray for the, the doctors who are performing uh, all the abortions all over the world. We pray for them. We want them to get saved because if they do come to the Lord, they'll stop doing that. You know. It says in verse 15, 14, we know that we have passed out of death into life because we love the brethren. He who does not love abides in death, meaning you're still dead spiritually. See, this is all explaining how do you know you got eternal life and you're saved because you have a different attitude and a different, you know, feeling towards people now. You know what I mean? Verse 15, everyone who hates his brother is a murderer and you know that no murderer has eternal life abiding in him. Why do you, mur how do you murder them? Why does it say everyone who hates his brother is a murderer? You want to know why? Because if you hate your brother and you're not being kind to them because you desire that even though they hate you and they're evil, you don't desire for them to come to the Lord. You're just like the devil killing them because you should be kind and desire to forgive them and everything because it's going to be you that God uses to bring them to life. You know what I mean? So if you're at, at odds with them and fighting, you're working with the devil to murder them and keep them dead. And that's why we're supposed to be kind even to our enemies to bring them back to life, to bring them to Christ so he can cause them to be born again. You know what I mean? 
Don't be a murderer, uh, uh, an accomplice to what Satan's trying to do. That's why a lot of times Satan will laugh and want you to still hold a grudge against somebody, be angry because you're working with him to keep that person dead. But if you can overcome you and let Christ move in you and live through you, you can be used by Christ to bring that dead friend back to life. Amen. The devil don't want that. So you're an accomplice then in murder. In verse 16, it says, we know love by this, that he had laid down his life for us. And we ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. When you got to get beyond your feelings and emotions that you have towards somebody, you are now laying your life down. You don't want to give in to that person. You're like, "Mm -mm, I don't care. She has always been this way to me. He has always been that way to me. Ain't no way I'm going to. Well, guess what? You ain't laying your life down then. To lay your life down is to do what you normally would not do. But why does he ask you to lay your life down? Because he expects you to be able to because you've been empowered to. You got the Holy Ghost in you to be able to do that, right? People are always looking for signs and wonders on the outside. It's a sign and a wonder to get me to be nice to somebody. You know what I mean? Just to be nice to somebody. Because Lord knows, man, without the Holy Spirit, you don't want to be nice to nobody. You want to go off on somebody, you know? I think there's a window in my house when I wake up where I'm not led of the Holy Spirit. I think it's right when I open my eyes. When my wife looks at me and says, I I just barely open it. She's like, did you take the trash out to the road? And I'm like, huh, huh, huh? The truck is coming. It's down the street. I'm like, girl, I I ain't being led of the Spirit right now. You better back up. I think it's just that brief five seconds. You know what I mean? And I got to catch myself. There I am dragging, you know. Go out there. Sometimes forget. Don't even put pants on. I'm out there. And the neighbors are like, oh, my goodness. Pastor Chris, look at him. You ever walked outside like that? <laughs> I did on accident. That truck was coming. My wife was like, you got to take the trash out. And I'm like, wow, man. I put my shirt on. Didn't put no pants on. And walked right outside carrying those cans. Híjole. That's too much information. I'm sorry. Verse 17, but whoever has the world's goods and sees his brother in need and closes his heart against him, how does the love of God abide in him? What's the key to show that you are born again and you are a new creation in Christ and that you have life is that you look out for others. You ain't selfish anymore. You got it? That's a major. All of these are signs to prove that you are saved and born again. How can you be sure that when you die, you're going to go be with the Lord? All of these things, man, all of these things add up to being a new creation in Christ. You know, stop doubting and wondering, am I if I die right now? Am I right? Well, God, do you love people or are you holding grudges? Would you give someone the shirt off of your back or are you stingy and don't do nothing for nobody? That is a telltale sign whether you're a new creation or not. You got it? And then he says in verse 18, little children, let us not love with word or tongue, but in deed and truth. You got it? Verse 19, we will know by this that we are the, of the truth and will assure our heart before him. That's the key. You want to have peace and know that you are going to be with God? If something happens to you right there, all of those things, do you live that way? Does your mind think that way? Then it's because God is working in you that way. And therefore, your heart should be at peace. That no matter, hey, the devil ain't got nothing on me and in me, like Jesus said. Jesus said, the devil ain't got nothing in me. There ain't nothing in me that where I feel convicted and condemned that if something happens to me and someone comes to the doors because I preach against abortion, I preach against lesbianism and homosexuality, and I preach against these other things, that they come to the door and kill me one day. I ain't afraid. I ain't tripping. I have peace of God. I know my heart is assured that I'm going to be with the Lord immediately, you know. And if they hit me one time and they didn't do nothing, I I, I probably because of my desire to want to go be with the Lord right away. Hit me again, brother. One more time. Come on, man. Send me to be with Jesus. Come on. That'd be so beautiful. You know what I mean? At any time, someone could walk through that door. In the last days, they're going to be against preachers and Christians. It's going to happen. They'll take me out first. We'll get y'all's pastor first. And then then what? You know, that's what they do in China. They drag the pastors out and they they assault them and kill them out in the wilderness. Leave them out there. But the next person in line picks that Bible study up. They take him. Next guy in line. 
You'll find out who the real Christian in this church is. Did they take me out? Who's going to come up and be taken out next? Mm-mm. Shoot, I ain't going to church no more, you know? We'll find out. That's what we're really going to find out who really are the Christians when, when, when the government takes over and no longer lets us have church, no longer lets us pray, and all of that kind of stuff. That's, that's what we're going to find out. We're going to find out. Let's go on. So, making notes and talking about being a new creation says, we aren't called to be saved just to enter into heaven. You know this note. The Lord's kingdom, but we are called to be saved. What does it say? We are called to be saved, transformed in order that the works of the devil could be what? Destroyed. That's why the Lord wants us to come to him. He does. Many people want Jesus just to get into heaven. But but the Bible teaches us in the book of Titus. Right. And also in first John in chapter five, verse seven through verse 10, the Bible teaches us that Jesus came to die in order that we would have an opportunity to be filled with the spirit, to be different people, new creations in Christ. Right. That's what the works of the devil are. The works of the devil are hating, not forgiving, you know, holding grudges, not sharing, lying, pride, you know, lust. That, those are the works of the devil. That's why Jesus came. So if that's why Jesus came and you believe in Jesus, then guess what Jesus is doing? He's destroying the works in the, of the devil in you, your life, in my life. How often? Every day. In 1 John chapter 3, verse 7 through 9. Let's look at that one more time just to recap. In verse 7 through 9 of 1 John chapter 3, it says, Little children, make sure no one deceives you. The one who practices righteousness is righteous, just as he is righteous. What was, what's righteous? All those things we said. Loving your brother, loving your enemies, praying for others, you know, giving to those in need. That's righteousness. You wouldn't do that if the Holy Ghost wasn't in you. And if you did, you would do it until somebody was ungrateful and said, I ain't helping them no more because they don't appreciate it. You got it? But when you're born again, even when they don't appreciate it, you're like, you know what? The Bible says to keep giving and the Lord's going to discipline them big time. You know what I mean? So whenever you give me something, you think I'm not grateful. Don't stop. Just keep giving it to me. The Lord will handle me. (laughs) Look at y'all. What? It says, verse eight, the one who practices sin is of the devil. Do you notice the difference practicing? How many of you are perfect? None. We already established that. But what is our saying? None of us are sinless. But with the Holy Ghost in us, we begin to sin what? Less. Okay. So let me ask you a question. When you do sin, are you practicing that sin or does it just happen out of the blue, just came out? Most of the time it just comes out, right? Because you're still human, but you're not practicing it. It wasn't like you say, man, next person, I'm just going to go off on. Them. You know what I mean? You're not practicing that. That's the difference between a new person and someone who's not born again. All right. Look at verse Um, Eight, the one who practices sin is of the devil, for the devil has sinned from the beginning. The son of God appeared for this purpose. Why did Jesus come to destroy the works of the devil? In verse nine, no one who is born of God practices sin because why? His seed abides in him. You don't practice sin because the Holy Ghost is in you, changing and transforming you over and over and over. If you are a Christian who does believe in Jesus Christ and you're struggling with sin, it's because you're not getting the word of God in you. And like I said earlier, if the word of God isn't in you, the Holy Ghost can remind you on what to obey. You got it? So what do you do with someone who's struggling with sin? You get them in the word and show them in the word where God says. So once they heard it, I guarantee you give them a couple of weeks. If they truly have the Holy Spirit, they won't continue to practice that sin over and over. They might do it once or twice. But by that third time, they're going to be feeling like, you know what? If they really have the Holy Ghost, man, this isn't right. God doesn't. I I don't feel right doing this. You know what I mean? They will. You just got to get them to what? The word. You got to get them to see it. And that's why I love that. It says he cannot sin and doesn't practice sin if you're born of God because his seed abides in him. And he cannot sin because he's born of God. Meaning you don't willfully want to just do that. And you might willfully do something even though you're born again. But once again, it's because you don't know the word of God right. And the Holy Spirit convicts you and judges you based on what you what? No. My people perish for lack of what? Knowing, for lack of knowledge. That's what it is. But notice he said they perish for lack of what? Knowledge. But he called them what? My people. 
You can be God's people, God's son, God's daughter, and never accomplish anything for God because you're not learning God's word. That's why it doesn't matter. You need to get God's word in you. You may, you may not be successful in your marriage. You may struggle in relationships. You may not be someone who learns to care and be considerate of others, of others because the Holy Spirit in you is trying to direct you, but he could only point you to the light. But if you don't get the word of God in you, which is the light, you are going to perish in this life, even though you'll be saved for lack of what knowledge. You're not going to have a blessed and fulfilled Christian life. It ain't going to happen. People who don't believe in the eternal security of our salvation say that it's because they don't believe that a person can live any way they want to. Mm, mm, mm. That a person can live any way they want and still expect to enter into heaven. How many of you believe that? Do you believe that that true Christians can live any way they want to? And still, are you changing it? OK, but you got it now. OK, so. Do you believe that when someone becomes a Christian that they can just live any way they want to? Did you, when you became a Christian, did you believe that? So why is it that the people who believe that you can lose your salvation, they think that's what we think? No one who's a true Christian thinks, oh, oh, I'm going to heaven now. I can do whatever I want to. Come on, babe. And come on, babe. Let's go. Absolutely not. You're born again. Your mind doesn't even work that way. It's even hard to imagine that. Why? Because you don't practice sin why because the seed of God is in you and what people who don't understand eternal life and eternal security what they do is they leave out of the equation the Holy Ghost they're like bro you got to stop smoking and drinking bro you got you can never stop smoking and drinking unless the Holy Ghost is in you to help you stop you got it you got to bring them the word bro you 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 know you've got to do this they're leaving out the fact that you wouldn't want to if the Holy Spirit wasn't in there. And that's why they mess it up. Even though they, they believe that salvation is by faith, they want to think that you keep your salvation by working. You didn't get your salvation by working. You got it by faith. And you're going to keep it by faith and overcome sin by faith. Amen? By faith in who? In him who's doing a work in you. It says that we are God's workmanship. That means he's perfecting who he wants us to be on the inside of us. It's not us. Our job is just to get the word of God in there. And all of a sudden, the word of God comes out. If you don't put nothing in, nothing what? Comes out. So if you think by being a Christian, all of a sudden, you're going to go to sleep and wake up the next day. And all of a sudden, you're good. You're a perfect Christian. You're like, don't make no mistakes or nothing. Man, if you ain't getting the word, you can be a Christian who believes in Jesus Christ, filled with the Holy Ghost, and be falling in your life. Why? Because you don't have the word of God in you. Man lives by what? Every word of God, not by bread. We don't live on bread alone, by every word of God. When Jesus was attacked and, and, uh, and, and came against by Satan, what did he, he, what did he say? You know, I'm going to pray about it. No, he didn't. He said, you know what? The word of God doesn't say that. That's not what God's word says. But Jesus could only say what he knew. You got it? When temptation comes, you, you're not, you, you should talk to yourself, you know? Not too long ago, and I'll just be open and honest. I'll be like Brother Juan, transparent. Not too long ago, I was at the store, and I ran into someone who in high school I used to like, and she used to like me, and we bumped into each other and said, hey, I saw you, know, I saw, you you're pastor now in church. And I'm like, yeah, you know, she's real touchy-feely, and I kept backing up. Every time she went like that, I took another step, so she wouldn't touchy-feely, you know what I mean? She goes, oh my goodness, Chris, you changed someone, and, 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 and all of that, right? But my mind told me, because I know what God's word says, and I just kept in my mind repeating everything the scripture says about that, you know what I mean? Until finally, you know, I had to just kind of really it was almost like we we're this far away like 20 feet like come on girl stop you know it's crazy the devil will try to tempt anybody doesn't matter who you are don't ever think the devil won't try to get you he'll try to get you too you know silliness but if it wasn't for the word of god in me i probably would have been like oh shucks oh oh my goodness i'm all blushing now girl stop it you're crazy you know what i'm talking about give it into my flesh Oh, here's something. 
Can a person who professes to be a Christian actually live any way they want and expect to enter into the kingdom of God and his holy heaven? Can they? No, they can't, right? Absolutely not. What's the answer? I got it. I'll change it. That way you change it backwards. The answer is no. You can't do what you want to do. That's what you learned in the beginning. The reason you come to the Lord is because you're not supposed to live any way you what? And the reason you came to God is because you knew you were living what? Wrong. So there ain't no Christian who believes that they won't lose their salvation, who thinks that, oh, I'm saved now. I can do whatever I want. To. Ain't no Christian think that way, man. And if they do, they ain't no Christian. You know what I mean? They ain't no Christian, man. So I got a question for you. Here's my question. Do Christians never sin again once they become a Christian? Yes or no? They do sin. Christians will sin, but they don't sin willfully. They don't practice sin, but they will sin, right? So let me ask you, if you can lose your salvation, when do you lose it? Do you lose it when you eat too much as a glutton? Do you use it when you get a little white lie? Did you use it when you cussed your wife out? Or did you use it when you had a bad thought in your head? Because Jesus says it's even a sin when you have a bad thought against somebody. When did you lose your salvation? And then if you lost it, when did you get it back? Did you get it back when you went and apologized? Or did you, because now your salvation comes back after you apologize. But you don't get salvation by apologizing. You get salvation by believing in Jesus Christ. That he was perfect. You got it? So if you can lose it, do you know you did? And then if you get it back, do you get a letter from God that tells you, okay, I reinstated you? How do you know? God is a God of order. He doesn't play games with people like that. God will either give you his spirit because he knows all your life what you're going to do already. That's why Jesus said, and we'll see in a little while, he said, y'all are clean except for one of you. Jesus didn't say y'all are clean just for a little while. And y'all could end up like Judas. No, he didn't say that. He says, y'all are clean, but one of you is not. Why? Because Jesus would never give himself completely to the one who would never want to be with him. God gives himself to those of us who he knows he could cause us to want to repent and change. You got it? He knows who are his and who aren't his, man. So if anyone says, well, brother, um, you can lose salvation. Okay, then answer my question. When do I lose it? When? When I, when, when I don't wake up and take the trash out and now my wife is mad at me, when did I lose it? Did I lose it when I accidentally forgot to take the papas back in the store and pay for them? When did I lose it? What sin will cause me to lose it is my question to you. There isn't one. Why? Because all Christians who are true Christians sin differently. And Jesus has done what? Paid for every single one of them, past, present, and future. But you see, by me saying that, they'll say, yeah, so what you're saying, you can sin whenever? No, we don't say that. What we're saying is that if you're truly a Christian, you don't practice wanting to sin. As a matter of fact, it, it scares you to even want to live that way again because God delivered you from that. That's a truly born again person doesn't think in a way to want to sin and sin and sin. But if you're not born again, you're like, oh, bro, God knows. God knows, God knows what I'm doing, honey. I'll be home later, like later, like next week. You know what I mean? That boy ain't born again. Let's stop it, man. That kind of person, you ain't born again, you know? You can't say you're born again and you're practicing, practicing. You know what I'm talking about? Ain't no way. Don't put me in that category. Just because you, you think that people can lose their salvation, you don't understand the work of the Holy Ghost in somebody's life. The Bible is clear that if someone is born again, you can see the fruit. You can see the change in their life. And if they're not born again, the Bible even tells us, how do you know who is saved and who isn't? Who's your brother and who's not? Well, the one who doesn't look like he's changing, the Bible says, be careful for that one because he may not be your brother. You know, that's how you know if it's easy. And the Bible even tells us that the world could know who's saved and who's not saved. How do they know? By our love for one another and our sacrifices for one another. And the world will see that we are one with God by those actions. So if they know that I'm saved by my love, God, man, I'm telling you right now, I know I'm saved because the Holy Ghost is inside of me, you know? How are you going to tell me, bro? bro you? So if you can lose your salvation, right? Well, you, can you ever have peace? Because... Do you get a letter in the mail that tells you you lost it? Who tells you you did? 
Come on, y'all. There are going to be people going to try to convince you to be afraid and not live in. You know why we worship the way we do here at Twin City? We know we're saved, man. We know God has done a work in us. If God wouldn't have done a work in us, we would care less about any one of y'all. You know what I mean? That's how you know you're born again, man. You just know that you know. You know what I mean? Let's keep going. In Romans chapter 3, verse 23, it says, For we all fall short of the glory of God. All of us fall short of perfection. No one's perfect, but you will start changing. You got it? After a while of that thing that you do, if you really have the Holy Spirit, you'll get tired. God will keep speaking to you. Stop that. What I tell you, and then you still do it. And then you're at home, you're laying in bed, you're like, golly, why did I do that? You're not feeling, why did I do that? Because you noticed you did something wrong. You're feeling like that because God is telling you in your head, why did you do that? And you're just repeating what he said. Oh, man, why did I do that? You're right. Why did you do that? If you're a child of God. In 1 John chapter 1. Okay, if they say I can lose my salvation, let's look at this at 1 John chapter 1. Beginning in verse 5. It says, this is the message we have heard from him and announced to you that God is light and in him there is no darkness at all. If we say that we have fellowship with him and yet walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. You see, walking in darkness means you're practicing the darkness. If you say you're a Christian, but you're like, oh, God understands, bro. God knows. He knows I ain't perfect. Yes, he knows you ain't perfect, but that's why he gave you the Holy Spirit so you can start practicing righteousness. That's why he gave us the Holy Ghost. And here it says in verse 7, if we walk in the light as he himself is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. To walk in the light means that God knows you're not perfect. You know you're not perfect. The pastor definitely knows none of y'all are perfect. And y'all know that I'm not perfect. But all of us are walking in the light, meaning we're open to each other. That's why it's important to always be in fellowship, like Brother read earlier, to keep the fellowship. Why? So we can see and help each other out when someone disappears from the fellowship for a while it's because that you know the enemy's trying to draw them away to get them to fall you know what i mean we stay close to each other and we're always in the light exposed to y'all if i'm around you all the time i got no time to be sinning you know what i mean you got an eye on me you know what i'm doing you know and here it says that we walk in the light as he himself is in the light we have fellowship with one another and the blood of jesus his son cleanses us from all sin Walking in the light is also saying that you're open to God. When you when you sin, he knew you were going to and you catch it when you do and you go to God and you repent. You're open to God. You're in the light. You ain't hiding nothing. You know what I mean? I ain't got nothing to hide from y'all. Nothing. That's why I don't put no locks on my phone. No, no. I don't need no locks on anything. Nothing. You can go to my phone, open it up at any time. If you ever see my phone laying anywhere, if I leave it in the church, you can just go through. You ain't going to find nothing. Devil ain't got nothing on me. And I thank God for that because of the Holy Spirit. But you never know. Tides could change. The devil tries to fight, 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 fight. You know what I mean? Ain't none of us perfect. That's why you got to pray for one another, man, that we don't fall. You know what I mean? Pray that we don't fall. Look at verse 8. If we say that we have no sin, we are deceiving ourselves and the truth is not in us. Okay, so what sin causes me to lose my salvation? Because the Bible just said, if I say I never sin, then I'm deceiving myself. Okay, so in order for me not to be deceived, which sin do I commit that makes me lose my salvation? Which one? I, mean, I want the one, I want the person who thinks you can lose your salvation to be specific. Which specific sin? Causes me to lose my salvation. You can't lose your salvation with no sins. Because if you're blasphemous and if you deny the Holy Ghost and Jesus Christ, you're never saved in the first place. So let's keep looking at this. If we say that we have no sin, we are deceiving ourselves and the truth is not in us. What's the truth? That... You ain't perfect. And there was only one who was perfect. That's the truth. And what else is the truth? Let's keep reading verse 9. That if we confess our sins, he is faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And look at verse 10. This one's big time. If we say that we have not sinned, we make God out to be a liar and his word is not in us. What's his word? 
His word is that he's there for you when you need him to. But because the Holy Spirit is in you, he's expecting you to let the Holy Spirit lead you. That's the truth. And when you're not turning to practice more righteousness than you are still living the way you used to live, you're not growing in God's word. And that's why it's important to be a part of a church. Let everyone see you in the light. Let, get to know your pastor, man. If you go to a church and you dip in and dip out, you don't got no relationship with a pastor, you can be sleeping with five or six different women and no one knows, man. And you're going to be deceived. You're going to die. And you thought because you went to that church that had a good worship, big old church, lights and everything, parking for everybody, but you were just dipping in, had no relationship with nobody, you die, you're going to figure out, oh my gosh, I really wasn't a Christian. Why? Because you didn't have a pastor in your life and other brothers and sisters who could see what, the way you were really living and to tell you and bring correction to you. That's why we need each other. Correct me. You know what I mean? If you see me doing something I shouldn't do, correct me. That's what we should be doing. And you want to know, most people don't want to become members of churches anywhere because they don't want to be what? They don't want to be accountable and corrected. That's right. Mm -mm, I'm going to sit in the back. I ain't making friends with no ladies and no men. Nobody know me. Your phone beeping. Beeping. Three different men done beeped it, beeped it. Mm, I can't wait to get out of church. I'm going to go watch the game with this one, go have drinks with this one, and dinner with this one. Praise God. I know women who do that. I know women who do that. And they, they say they're Christians. She's practicing what? Sin. A true Christian who has a seed inside does not practice what? Sin. Not willfully. All right, let's go. So you saw that. If we say we have not sinned, we make God out to be a liar and his word is not in us. So know this, there aren't any scripture passages that clearly state that a truly and genuinely born again believer can can have their salvation revoked or removed from them by God. Here's the key for those who say you can lose your salvation and that you're not a truly new creature in Christ and that you've put on the new self and no longer have the old self. For those who say you can lose your salvation, my question for them is when does God remove your salvation from you? Because he's the one who gave it to you. How do you know or I know when God has removed it? You see, when they talk silliness like you can lose your salvation, they're, they're acting as if they're divine and they know exactly what God's going to do at an exact moment. But the question is, when's the exact moment? Because we need to know what the exact sin is. And then once God does revoke it, how do we know he did? And then how do we know and trust that he can give it back to us? What do I got to do now? They got, the person says, oh, God took it away from me. Oh, bro, you lost your salvation yesterday. When did I lose it? When, when your team lost and you jumped up out of the couch and started cussing, you lost your salvation. Really? Yeah, bro, you sinned. You sin we all fall short of the glory, bro. You know what I'm talking about? <laughs> there are warning passages, but, everybody say but. What do we do with passages like this? John 10, 22. There are warning passages, but remember, I just equipped you tonight to remember the one thing, that when God warns you or God tells you that he requires for you to do something, he doesn't tell you that he requires for me and you to do something because we can do it by ourselves. He expects for us to be able to do it because he gave us the Holy Spirit to help us do it, right? So don't ever feel like, oh, how am I going to do that? Huh? We got the Holy Ghost. What you need to do is say, Holy Spirit, you know that I'm weak in this area. Help me in this area, Holy Spirit. When I sleep, I know you're helping me. Even when I don't see you, you're what? Working. You got that? Verse 22 of John chapter 10. Here's what we see. In verse 22, it says, at that time of the feast of the dedication, when it took place at Jerusalem, it was winter and Jesus was walking in the temple in the portico of Solomon. The Jews then gathered around him and were saying to him, how long will you keep us in suspense? If you are the Christ, tell us plainly. And Jesus answered him, I told you and you do not believe the works that I do in my father's name. These testify of me, but you do not believe because you are not of my sheep. 
My sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me. To hear his voice is to hear the correction of the Holy Spirit in your life. You will hear God if God gave you a new heart. Because why did God say he gave us a new heart? He gave us a new heart to want to do what he wants us to do. That's why he gave us the new heart, the new Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit inside of us. You know what I mean? Because God knows without the Holy Spirit in us, you won't want to do what pleases him. You got that? Keep reading. Verse 27, my sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me. Remember when Jesus says in Matthew chapter 7, remember when many come say, Lord, Lord, didn't we do this? Didn't we do that? And he says, get away from me. I never what? Knew you. Why didn't he know them? Because they were the ones who when he spoke to them to correct them and to lead them and to guide them, they didn't hear his voice. The shepherd knows his sheep and the sheep know their shepherd's voice. You got it? So they look like Christians on the outside, but no change in their life proved they weren't hearing the voice of the shepherd. You got it? Then now he says, I know you. Why? Because you knew him. To know him is to do what he tells you to do. You may not do it immediately, but you're growing in that direction, you know? Man, that's some good stuff. Verse 28. I give eternal life to them. To them who? Who hear my voice and do what I tell them to do. That's how you know you got eternal life. If you used to be one of those guys like, what? Boy, shoo, man, you know, I was going off on that dude. You know what I'm talking about? If you were that guy and you're not that guy no more, man, you got eternal life. If you confess Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, because only the Holy Spirit will give you the ability to refrain from doing what you used to do. The Holy Ghost is called in the book of Thessalonians, the restrainer. He restrains you from sinning. You ever, you ever been in a situation where you were out and, and the cops were coming, but you were, you were throwing down or something crazy was going on and they were trying to hold you back? Get back, Chris. Come on, man. Stop it, Chris. Chris. Restraining you, right? That's what the Holy Spirit does. Why does he restrain us? Because he wants us to be blessed to the Father and he knows that the sin will cause the windows of heaven to close. He doesn't want that for us because when we grieve, he grieves. And when we're filled with joy, he throws the fruit of the spirit through us. just like, you know. Now look, verse 28. And I give eternal life to them and they will never perish. We, I can get into Greek with you on this word never, but I need you to understand this. He says, and I give them eternal life and they will never perish. And no one, say no one, no one will snatch them out of my hand. Now, let's look at this because, let me just finish it and then we'll go to it. Because I'll show you what their argument is. Verse 29, my father who, he's, who has given them to me is greater than all. And no one is able to snatch them out of the father's hand. I and the father are one. So let's look at this note. Can a person, because here's, here's how arrogant they get. And I know one word is, is spelled wrong in there, but don't worry about it. This is how arrogant they get. Go back. Can a person take themselves out of the hands of both God, the Father, and Jesus Christ, the Son? They say, oh, bro, I know what the scripture says. Jesus says that it says right here that they will never perish and no one could take them out of his hands. But they could jump out if they want to. Well, they can turn their back on him if they want to. That person doesn't know the work of the Holy Spirit in your life. That person doesn't know that the same Holy Spirit that keeps the universe moving, the sun in its place, sustains the earth to turn, keeps the oxygen for us to breathe. That same restraining Holy Spirit is the one that never lets you go beyond where God had already put you. He put you in his blessing and he'll never let no one take you out of his blessing. Amen. How you gonna, I'm just, so I belong to myself all of a sudden? I thought, I thought you told me in your sermon that Jesus bought me with a price. I don't belong to myself. Now all of a sudden I belong to myself and I could jump out of his hand? Come on. If I belong to him, he, that's why I belong to him. Because if I didn't belong to him, I would jump out of his hand. But because I belong to him, he won't let me jump out of his hand. Amen? You hear the difference? Let's look. Because 
They'll use their phrases, but they got no scripture to back it up. Let's look at the next passage. Because Jesus says that word never means never. Because if you can jump out of Jesus' hands, then you can make Jesus a liar. Because Jesus said, they will never be taken away from me. And I'll never lose them. Wait. But Jesus, you should have said, you'll never lose them or, or no one could snatch them out of your hand unless they jump out. You should have said that because now if I jump out, you lost me. Now y- your words are, are weak. They don't, they don't mean what you said. You hear what I'm saying? Man, I'm telling you. There's just people who want to earn their salvation with God so bad. They want, they want to be in control of whether they stay with God or not. Why? Because as long as they're doing what they're doing to try to stay saved and to be right with God, they're always in competition with the next person. You ain't living as holy as I am. You know what I'm talking about? Me and God are different. You ain't got the anointing like I got the anointing. Your anointing and my anointing are the same. It's just that the Holy Ghost will activate different when you're in a place of position to be used. And when you're being used, the anointing is being activated. Amen. If you don't ever feel the anointing, because you're not allowing yourself to be activated in service. Get into service and you feel the anointing coming out. The gifts of the spirit, everything start coming out and flowing. Amen. People go into this conference and to that conference and that see that pastor and this apostle and that prophet because they got a special man. Give me a break. You got the same anointing as them. You just ain't activating it. You're driving over there to get it when you can sit at home. It's right there. He's in you. You know. Look at John six. We could we could continue John ten, but in John chapter six verse thirty seven, look at this. All that the Father gives me will come to me, and no one who comes to me, I will certainly not cast out. And they'll say, yeah, but you can cast yourself out. Boy, they just keep trying, you know. I will certainly not cast out. And then when they make a comment, look, who's the most beautiful person ever? Jesus Christ. So what you're telling me in your arrogance of conversation is that you're telling me that he said he won't cast me out, but you're telling me that I don't see him when I get to see him as beautiful as he is and that I will want to leave him? Absolutely not. Those who come to him will be like Peter and say, where will we go? You're the most beautiful thing in my life. You changed everything for me. You took me from where I was just lost and you brought me into life. Who else can be with me and do with me what only you can do? Only a fool would turn on Jesus Christ. But when you got the Holy Spirit, you never become a fool again because your eyes are open and you'll never not see who Jesus is. Amen. That's why he says, you'll, my sheep will never follow another shepherd. They'll never go back after the devil. Why? Because I've shown myself to them and I'm beautiful and I'm everything they've ever wanted. And who would want to walk away from Jesus Christ? If you say, babe, I'll never leave you, baby. You know it's me and you. And she's just a chick on the planet. How much more Jesus Christ? I'll never leave you. Absolutely not. Now that I've seen you, ain't nothing for me out here. Amen. Nothing. So when you say, we'll walk away from Jesus, you'll jump out of his hand. What fool would want to? That's exactly true. A fool would not even want to be with Jesus. But once he opens your eyes, once you see him, that's it. How many of you fell in love with somebody or you're in love with who you're married to? Because not everybody who's married is in love. But you hear what I'm saying? Right? It was love. Look what you've done to me. You're in school and you're walking and you see her in the hallway and it's like, wow, this girl, I just love her. Oh my God. That's a chick. If you really are exposed to who Jesus is, man, you're in love forever. You are in love forever. But you know how you stay in love? That's why he's got to give you his spirit. Because your own heart doesn't have the capacity to love the way God wants you to love. So he's got to give you his love to love him back with. Amen. That's some beautiful stuff there, y'all. That's why when I saw him, I was like, man, I want 
Jesus, that's amazing. He's a savior. Man, I believe in him. I, I want that. I want to get delivered from the way I am. I want my life to change. And boom, he said, you really want to? Yes, I receive you as the most perfect being. I believe in everything you did. I believe in everything you're doing. I believe in everything you said you're going to do. And boom, he said, you'll be in love with me forever now. You're mine. Now there ain't nothing. I might fall short and do something, but I don't forget who my husband Lord is. You know, even when you act crazy at home, you don't forget who you're married to. You go into your feelings for a couple of hours, but you know, <sighs> you know. <sighs> Look at that. All that the Father gives me will come to me. And no one who comes, listen, no one, that's emphatic. That means never, nothing, it's impossible. No river, no valley, no mountain, no depth, no demon, no angel, no false teacher. Nothing could take you away from this. No one who comes to me will I ever cast out. None. You know what he's saying? He won't cast you out. He didn't say, I'll cast them out when they fall short. I'll cast them out when they do this sin. I'll cast them out when they do this sin. I'll never cast them out. Why? Because we will walk in the light with him. And we know and learn that when we fall short, we can repent. And our Lord and Savior will cleanse us right there at that moment. He'll never cast you out. And you'll be the type of person when you do fall, you know that you can come to him. And you know what? If you really love him, you won't do that again. You know what I mean? A person who really loves the Lord won't do something, feel convicted, and then just want to keep going back. A person who's stubborn and saved might respond that way, but that's a person who's not in fellowship. Because if you're in fellowship with me and you fall short of the glory of God, correction from God's going to happen quick before I even say anything because of the fact that God's guarding me and he's guarding Twin City Community Church and the family of Twin City Community Church. So when we fall short, correction from God happens immediately around here. Know what I'm talking about? Let's look at this verse. John 8, verse 12. Man, how could they think that somebody would not want to be with Jesus? Come on. Once you've seen him, mm -mm. remember the Bible said he opened our eyes to see him in a way that you just couldn't see him with your natural eyes. There's just no way. Look at verse 12 of John chapter 8. Then Jesus again spoke to them saying, I am the light of the world. He who follows me will not walk in the darkness, but will have the light of life. Listen, I want you to hear this and don't ever forget this ever again. Every time Jesus speaks, he's prophesying. And when Jesus says, all who come to me will not walk in darkness, he means that when you come to him, because he puts his seed of the spirit inside of you, you will not want to walk in darkness. He spoke it, and when he speaks it, it will come to pass. Even if you were hard-headed, you now got the Holy Ghost and will not stay hard-headed. Why? Because Jesus prophesied that you wouldn't. Amen? Man, you got to see Jesus' words as... Man, you, you, people talk about, oh, this, this prophet prophesied to you. Forget that. Did you see the prophecy of Jesus? Jesus said, you'll never want to walk in darkness. Man. And look what it says in verse 51. Verse 51, he says, truly, truly. That means, listen to me, I'm going to say it one more time. Truly, truly, he says. That's like him saying, listen to me clearly now, he says. Truly, truly. I say to you, if anyone keeps my word, he will never see death. He's not talking about you're never going to die physically. He says if you keep his word, you will never see death. But there it is again. Who keeps his word? Those who have the spirit. If you don't have the spirit, you won't want the word. So if you are keeping his word, he's making you feel at peace. If you like my word and you love my word, just know that you'll never die and be separated from me. That's trying to excite you. He's trying to give you so, so much joy and peace to not be worried. Am I saved? Am I lost? Am I saved? Am I lost? Did I lose it now? Did I lose it yesterday? Tomorrow? Last week? And how do I know I got it back? What kind of Christian peace is that? You're walking around and pulling your hair out. You don't even got hair. This is beautiful. If anyone keeps my word, he will never see death. And then they'll say, yeah, bro, but you don't understand. You got to keep his word. It makes me mad. Once again, I'm telling you that 
I can't keep his word by myself. Stop leaving the Holy Ghost out of the equation. The only way he tells us to do it is because he knows he's going to give us an edge in life. He's going to equip us and give us the ability to do what he tells us to do. Who can love God with all of their heart, with all of their mind, with all of their soul, and with all of their strength? Who can do that? No one can. So what does he do? He gives us a heart that's able to love God with all of our heart, with all of our soul, with all of our mind, and all of our strength. Amen? You can do nothing without him. And they find all these verses. Oh, but you got to do that. Yes, he says, I got to do that. But don't you know that the only ones who can do that are the ones who he's equipped to do it? Man, bro. Stop leaving the Holy Ghost. That's why they're always looking for, like you were saying, always looking for signs on the outside. But the Holy Ghost is showing us signs daily in the fact that you want his word. You want to praise him. That's a sign that he's there with you all day, every day. Amen. John 11, verse 6. I mean, y'all got me fired up. In verse 6. So when they heard, it says that he was sick, he stayed two days longer in that place where he was. Verse 7. Then after this, he said to the disciples, let's go to Judea again. Do I got John eleven six? Y'all got John eleven six? That's not the passage I want to read. There's interference. Where's that interference coming from? It's 25 and 26. I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me will live even if he dies. And everyone who lives and believes in me will never die. You got that? Everyone who believes in him will never die. He's prophesying. Why is he telling you that? Because once you believe in him, he seals you with the Holy Spirit and makes you to where you'll never what? Die now. You will never leave him. Why? Because he will never leave you. <laughs> Literally. Ever, ever. For all eternity. So, can anyone tell me why Jesus would make this kind of statement if it was possible that any situation or circumstance could make his statement false and thus make his prophecy false. Why would Jesus say things like, he who comes to me will never be lost. If it was possible that the one who came to him could be lost. Why would Jesus say, those who are in my hand, no one could snatch them out. If it was possible that they could ever leave his hand. That would make him out to be a false prophet. Or he'd be a liar. Or tell us a half truth. Okay, yes, Jesus said, uh, no one will snatch you out. But like I said earlier, but he didn't say you couldn't jump. I Dios mio. Jesus would have said, Jesus is wisdom. He's God. He would have said, no one could snatch them out of my hand. And, but if they want to go, I'm a gentleman and a loving God. I'll let them go. He didn't say that, did he? No, he didn't. No, he didn't. Look at 1 John chapter 5, verse 13. Brother Carlitos, we could be here all night, huh, Carlitos? Yes, sir. In 1 John, chapter 5, verse 13, here's what we see. Tell me if y'all see it too. These things I have written to you who believe in the name of the Son of God so that you may know, everybody say no, that you have what? If you don't know when you lose it and you don't know when you can get it back, how will you ever know that you got it? Got it? You who believe in the Son of God so that you would know. Got it? All you got to do is believe in him. And if you truly believed in him, he gives you the rest that you need in order to stay believing. Because remember, without Christ you can do what? You can't even believe in him without him helping you. Faith comes by what? Hearing what? Not your word, hearing what? His word. 
So he's so kind. He wants you to keep growing in faith. He gives you his word. But you wouldn't want his word unless he gave you something to want his word with. That's the new heart. That's the Holy Ghost inside of you. You got it? So even when he tells you your faith, faith comes by hearing. You're like, oh, man, I hear more than most people. Bro, you wouldn't even want to hear his word if the Holy Ghost wasn't there again. That's why he says, don't compete with each other. Ain't nothing none of y'all do on your own strength. You only do what you do because the Holy Ghost is there. Stop bragging in 1 Corinthians, it says. Don't brag that you do this and you do that and you got this gift and they got that gift. You can speak this way or sing this way. Stop it already. Nothing that you do is because you do it by yourself. If you want to glorify anybody, glorify who? Glorify the Holy Ghost. Thank you, Holy Spirit, for helping me to do this. We're almost done. John 14, 25 to 31. We only got three hours left. Hey, sometimes y'all set your house up for six hours just for a Super Bowl. You know what I'm talking about? Setting it up for a Super Bowl. And then the Super Bowl game happens. Y'all got all the cakes and everything. And then y'all chill. Come on, man. Why y'all, want, why, y'all, why y'all in a hurry to leave tonight? Why y'all in a hurry? John 14, verse 25. These things I have spoken to you while abiding with you. But the helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all that I said to you. There it goes. You won't remember or be convicted of the word of God by the spirit of God if you don't have the word of God in you. The Holy Ghost does what? He brings to your remembrance what God said. Well, you know what pastor taught the other day in that book? Well, you remember what you read in the Bible the other day? Holy Spirit telling you. He'll bring to what? Remembrance, right? Verse 27. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. Not as the world gives do I give to you. Do not let your heart be troubled, nor let it be fearful. There it is. If you didn't know that you know that you got eternal life, how could you have this kind of peace? You'd always be walking on eggshells. Man, I think I lost my salvation yesterday. What happened? I forgot to feed my dog. Mm -mm. Verse 28, you heard that I said to you, I go away and I will come to you. If you loved me, you would have rejoiced because I go to the father for the father is greater than I. Verse 29, now I have told you before it happens so that when it happens, you may believe. I will not speak much more with you for the ruler of this world is coming and he has nothing in me. But so that the world may know that I love the father, I do exactly as the father commanded me. Get up. Let us go from here. What is he saying? Likewise, Jesus said, how does the world know that he loves the father, that he does what the father wants? How does the world know that we are of God? We love one another. The signs are there, y'all. The signs are all there. Look at Galatians 4, 6. Galatians 4, 6. It says, because you are sons of God, God has sent forth the spirit of his son into our hearts, crying what? Abba, Father. Now, let me ask you a question. If you're a born again Christian, how many of you love God? Right? And how many of you know that God is your father? Right? Right? You may, the devil may make you feel so super guilty. See, the Holy Spirit will convict you what you did wrong, not to keep you feeling guilty, but he does it so you remember real quick and repent and get right with him immediately. But the devil comes in when he sees that you didn't repent and he puts guilt on there and you start feeling like God doesn't love me no more. Oh my God, we're not right. You know what I mean? That's the weight that Jesus doesn't want you to have. That's why he says immediately cast your burden upon him real quick. Sin is a burden. Cast it upon you. What's your care, son? Man, I let you down yesterday. Man, cast it to me real quick. Let me cleanse you right away in your mind. He cleansed us once and for all, but every now and then, because we're only human, we need to have our mind refreshed that he forgives us and that he loves us and that he'll never leave us nor forsake us. You know what I mean? In Romans 8, that's a long one. I don't even want to go there right now. This is too much. There's so much in there. But let's look at a couple of things real quick before we go. God has caused many to be born again, which has freed them from being slaves to sin. There's a difference between being a person in the world and being a slave to sin. The book of Romans taught us, and we saw that last week, where the Holy Spirit was given to us by God giving us a new heart to help us not to 
want to sin. You might sin, but you don't want to sin. Now I'm going to read like this shotgun passages real quick. Let's read them because I want this to get stuck in your spirit when you go home and keep thinking about this. Romans chapter 6 real quick. Run over there. Run, 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 run. Romans 6 verse 2. Let me start at verse 1. What shall I say then? Are we to continue in sin so that grace may increase? Like some people say, well, God is love. He'll forgive me for everything. That's a person who likes to practice sinning. They may not be born again. Because a person who is born again doesn't say something stupid like that. Well, God is going to forgive me anyway. So I'm just going to do this tonight. You know what I mean? Nobody thinks that way if you're born again. It says, shall we say then, are we to continue in sin so that grace may increase? May it never be. How shall we do How shall we who died to sin still live in it? Verse 4. Therefore, we have been buried with him through baptism into death, so that as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, so we too might walk in the newness of life. There it goes, being born again. Jesus died in order for me and you to be able to be born again. If Jesus wouldn't have died on the cross, the Father wouldn't have kept his word to his son. He told Jesus, pray, if I go, send them the helper. Send them the help. Keep them. If I go to the cross, keep them from the evil one. And then what did he say? Sanctify them. That's another thing he asked to the Father. What is sanctify? He said, sanctify them in your word. Your word is truth. So that's why you love God's word, because God is keeping his promise to his son to make you want his word. So if you don't come and like to hear preaching or like to read the Bible, it could be because the father can't keep a promise for you if you don't belong to his son. You got it? If you belong to his son, the father has to keep his promise to his son by making you want his word. That's what Jesus said. Keep them in your word. I'm going to the cross. Keep them in your word. Not only that, send them a helper. And the disciples are listening to this back and forth prayer. Jesus asking for all these things. You got to look at that one day so you can see what God has done for you. You know, in verse six, knowing this, that our old self was crucified with him in order that our body of sin might be done away with so that we would no longer be slaves of sin. Remember, we read in first John chapter three, verse seven through 10. The reason Jesus came to die was to put an end to the works of the devil to destroy him. How did he do that? By dying on the cross. And now the father, because Jesus kept his word by going to the cross, the father keeps his word by giving us the Holy Spirit on the inside of us to help us to not want to do what displeases the father you got that because remember before god gave you a new heart you had the old heart that's the old self right keep going real quick still verse six knowing this that our old self was crucified with him in order that our body of sin might be done away with so that we would no longer be slaves to sin the people in the world who don't got the holy spirit they're slaves to sin they don't know how to stop they make new year's resolutions they go to rehabs and stuff you know what i mean All you got to do is go to the Holy Ghost. Go to Jesus Christ. Give your life to Jesus Christ. The Holy Spirit will start changing your life. He'll start removing your addictions from you. He'll start changing your mind when you get the word of God inside of you. Amen. Ain't no counselor, psychiatrist going to be able to do for you what the Holy Ghost can do by himself. Amen. We don't need to subcontract that work to anyone. The Holy Ghost does the changing. Look at verse 8 through 10 real quick. Now, if we have died with Christ, we believe. What does that say? We believe that we shall also live with him. How do we believe? By faith. Verse 9. Knowing that Christ, having been raised from the dead, is never to die again. Death no longer is master over him. Meaning, me and you too. Since Jesus died for me and you, I don't got to worry no more. Since I believe in him, that God wants to destroy me through death. He doesn't want to send me to be far away from him. There's two kinds of death. Remember, physical death and spiritual death. Remember that when when God says he's going to keep us from death, he's not meaning everyone's going to die physically. He means the separation in the spirit in hell and heaven. That's death. All right. Verse 10. For the death that he died, he died to sin once and for all. But the life that he lives, he lives to God. Who's living the perfect life for me and you? Jesus is. You'll never be able to earn your salvation and you'll never live the perfect life to God. 11 and 12 real quick. Even so, consider yourselves to be dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. Verse 12. Therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal body so that you obey its lust. Why can you say that? Let's end with with these two notes. 
Because in our mortal bodies, we should not let sin reign because sin cannot reign in our recreated selves. Where does sin want to reign? In your flesh. But the new spirit man on the inside of you hates that. You got it? That's why it says, don't let it rain. How do you not let it rain? The more word you get in you, the less you'll let it rain. Because you'll be obedient to the word. And the more word you obey, the less sin you'll what? Do. You got it? Look at the next note. So this is the last note. So remember that we are not sinless, but we can, because of our new nature, sin less. Amen? Y'all good with that? There's all that and that. And that, and that, and that, and that, and that. <laughs> wow. All right, let me read these two to you. I won't do the passages. Like the Apostle Paul mentions in the book of Romans, the new heart that the Father gives us because of what Jesus did gives us, it says, gives us because of what Jesus did, gives us the overwhelming desire to please and love God. When you believed in Jesus Christ and God gave you the Holy Spirit, he gave you an overwhelming desire to want to please God. You remember before you had the Holy Spirit, you didn't care less what God thought. I don't care. I'm going to do these. <clears throat> I'm going to do these drugs. I'm going to drink this beer. I'm going to do all this whatever. I don't care what God says. You know what I'm talking about? But then when the Holy Spirit came in, you, all of a sudden you just didn't want that. didn't feel you. Like, you know? How many of you in front of your family and friends being born again right now, do you just act a fool at a birthday party? No, because now you, you feel like you got a reputation you need to keep. For who? For God. You want to make him look what? Bad. You're like, I ain't going to do that. Make God look bad. I ain't tripping, you know. But if you didn't have the Holy Spirit, you can care less. Boy, you're the, you're the center of the party. You know what I mean? <laughs> Doing backflips off table, you know, and everything. <laughs> All right. So, I don't know, what that, maybe that's a Hebrew word, professly. It should be perfectly, I think. Will we obey God? Perfectly, no. But while still in the flesh, we will, with this new heart, attempt by the power of His Spirit to honor Him, not just with our lips, but from and with our heart, soul, mind, and strength. You see, God was sick and tired of people trying to honor Him with their lips. That he said, I'm sick and tired of that. Uh, I got to do something to fix that. Because if I don't do nothing for them, they're always just going to honor me with the lips. And it's going to be around. Well, I'll never do that. Next week, do it. Oh, you know, God, I want this. Like the nation of Israel. And then do it. So God said, I'm going to have to put my spirit in them to help them. Because their spirit is evil. And God knew that. And God gave us his Holy Spirit in order for us to be able to do what pleases him. Amen. Y'all good? Let's stand to our feet. Thank you, God. Praise the Lord. Thank y'all for being patient. And for those of y'all who feel like you've been here for a long time, ain't nobody told you to get here at 5 o'clock. <laughs> Some of us got here, what, 6? 6? 6.15? God is good. Y'all like that worship song tonight? Just want to speak Jesus, you know? Just want to speak Jesus into your family into your heart, into your life. I want to speak Jesus into everything that's going on in your life. And I just want you to understand that the word of God was given to you and I for us to see what Jesus has prophesied over our lives. Everything that Jesus said was prophetic for us. And you got to believe that and receive that and walk by that. Don't let the devil cause or bring doubt. Don't let you not understanding who God is bring doubt. Amen. Trust God for all that he is. Father, we thank you this evening that no weapon formed against us will prosper, Lord God, as many say. But we understand and believe that, that because you have lifted up a people for you and given us a new heart, you've given us the ability, Lord God, to be yours and to live with you. We ask that if there's anyone here who is unsure of their walk with you, that they would just call out to you, Lord God, right there where they are, without a necessity to have to come to the front, but that they would where they are, call out to you, Lord God, and ask you to forgive them and to come into their life and to help bring change in their life, just as you've done for all of us who are here. Each and every one of us here who loves you, Lord God, who you've given a new heart to, we could testify of your wonders and your great works in our life. And so, Father, I pray that they too would fall in that category in line with those of us who have walked with you and seen what you want to do in our lives and 
by remembering what you've already done, Lord God. We love you and we praise you for everything that you've done and that you're doing and going to continue to do. Bless the little children in this church and the teenagers, Lord God, and every marriage and every struggling person in this place. Those who are dealing with sickness and disease, Lord God, we know that you could remove it and bring healing if it's your will and your perfect plan and purpose for that person, Lord God. And we also know that you know the days of the people that they were numbered even before we're born, Lord God. And in this world, we have trouble and sometimes we leave this planet because of sickness and disease. And that's how you numbered it. Not that you caused it, but that's what was to come. And you knew it, Lord God. And I pray that every person here would desire to be with you even more than desiring to be here. But if they desire to be here, I pray that they would do it because they want to serve your kingdom and lead more people out of darkness into your marvelous light. We give you all the praise, glory, and honor this evening, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Give the Lord praise. Amen. Thank you, Lord. Thank you all for joining us. Thank you all for coming this evening. Thank you all for being patient. We ask that you would continue to fellowship with us. Remember that next Sunday or this coming Sunday, church service is in this building for this week. Okay? We love you all. Thank you. If you want to give an offering, there's offering envelopes in the back. God bless and have a wonderful evening.